Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Uh, let us complete our discussion of Girish Karnath's plays with a last play, uh, which is a shorter monologue uh, called "Broken Images." Uh, it was it was it was it was performed in Hindi also as uh, "Bikre Bind," and it was also it, it was also uh, enacted in Kannada. Uh, in Kannada, the uh, Kannada version uh, of the play had uh, Aruditi Nag playing the protagonist. And in the English one that I watched, which was called Broken Images, you had Shabana Azmi playing the role of the protagonist, uh, whose name is Manjula uh, Naik. Now, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting form, uh, because the entire play uh, is a monologue uh, told from the perspective of the female protagonist, uh, Manjula Naik, who is a Kannada writer who has, uh, after having written in Canada for many years, has suddenly come up with an English novel. And uh, you uh, have, you're introduced to the other characters of the play uh, through Manjula Nayak, although they don't really have any, uh, much of a speaking, they don't really appear on stage, and they don't have a, a, a speaking part. Um, but uh, we, get, we are introduced to her husband Pramod, and we're also introduced to her sister Malini, uh, who is a disabled woman. Right? Uh, she is, uh, spends much of her life in a wheelchair at home because she is paralyzed from the waist below. And uh, the play itself uh, you know, is uh, staged in a very unusual and interesting fashion because you have the, the, ca the female character Manjula Nayak on stage. Uh, you also have uh, a TV screen. Uh, you have many TV screens and one, one of the TV screens on stage uh, has an image of Manjula Naik. Uh, it's, it's a speaking image. And so much of the conversation that takes place in the play is between uh, the female character Manjula Naik and her virtual image on screen. One day he did something completely unexpected. He was attracted to me but didn't know how to convey it. So he wrote a letter to Lucy about me and wrote me a letter about Lucy. Then he mailed her letter in an envelope addressed to me and vice versa. So I received this letter addressed to Lucy, moaning and groaning about how I had tortured him. And I didn't even know he was interested in me. And Lucy, of course, received the other letter. He thought he was being absolutely smart, totally original. We went and confronted him. Lucy tore her letter into shreds, flung the pieces on him and walked off melodramatically. I felt sorry for him. I said, idiot, every 15-year-old tries that trick, convinced it's never been done before. But hey. you married him, so the ruse worked. Ah, no ruse. He'd made such a fool of himself. He did the only thing he could to save his self-respect. He married me. I didn't mind. Mind? You would never have found another man of his caliber. Mm, I suppose so. And what happened to Lucy? She stopped talking to me. <laughs> Women uh, found him attractive. Malini too. Of course. She was a woman after all. Um, the play itself uh, is a comment on uh, the politics of language. Um, and uh, this, is, this becomes important uh, in the initial uh, phase of the play where, uh, you know, uh, there is this uh, impression that uh, Manjula Nayak's peers and her audience, her readership, uh, may probably be upset uh, with her for having uh, written something in English. Uh, as Manjula Nayak uh, portrays her own reception and the way she's perceived by her readers and uh, her peers, she makes it seem, uh, it's, it's actually a comment on uh, 
uh, the politics of writing in English, which uh, guarantees you access to a global audience. Uh, unlike perhaps uh, writing in a regional language like Kannada, which uh, certainly assures you a readership, but it's still a niche when compared to uh, English. And this, uh, in some sense, is also a, uh, a reflection of Girish Karnad's own life as someone who began writing in Kannada and wrote in Kannada for more than three decades and then decided to switch uh, or translate his works into English. And the impact that that had on his writing and his career as a playwright uh, is uh, reflected in the play because it's uh, suggested that you know the whole the act of writing in English or the or the, or the act of being translated into English, uh, you know, gives um, uh, Indian uh, English writers or Indian writers who have been translated uh, greater access to uh, global uh, literary readership uh, rather than uh, those who only write in regional languages. So. Uh, and so we see that also in the larger context of uh, post-colonial uh, Indian uh, literature, Indian literature in English, uh, where uh, you know you have a generation of writers uh, post Salman Rushdie, uh, you know, uh, who uh, you know have written in English, who have been received in English, who have been read world uh, worldwide. You also have uh, the example of um, uh, uh, Arundhati Roy, who has uh, written a novel in English. And, uh, and now two novels. And so the kind of uh, reception that she has uh, writing also about uh, Kerala uh, to a larger and, uh, you know, English audience and readership. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it's a question of power uh, when it comes to uh, writing in English and being translated into English. It, there's, a, there's, certain, there's certainly an impact that uh, it has on the reach that your work has. So uh, the um, uh, so that 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 in some sense becomes the focal point of uh, the play, uh, at least in the initial uh, uh, you know scene of the play. And uh, so for um, uh, I mean it's it's a very simple plot. I mean there's not there's not, I mean it's it's just revolves around a, a writer called Manjula Naik who has written in Canada and now begins writing in English. And much to the, uh, the, the disapproval of uh, her readers and her peers who think that it's, it's an act of betrayal um, because uh, they expected her to be loyal to Kannada. And this is assumption that, uh, as Manjula Nayak herself says, that there's an assumption that uh, writing in one's own regional language uh, corresponds to uh, you know, an, an authentic self, an authentic uh, sense of self. So you, know, you write in Kannada and so that apparently is the only way one can express oneself and one's life world uh, in the most um, uh, sincere and authentic fashion as opposed to writing in English, which is being considered uh, as, as, as a foreign language, as something which is culturally foreign. Um, so, uh, so then there's this whole debate on what it means to write in English as opposed to writing in Kannada. And uh, the and of course the play uh, you know is discussing uh, uh, the the question of of, uh, of I mean it's, it's it's relating the 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 question of global of the politics of language with with genre right so so that the the question of form becomes very important uh, because uh, the play is uh, talking about uh, the. Um, uh, the uh, a, a Canada female writer who has written a novel and not a play, right? So, so writing the whole idea of writing a play uh, is 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 uh, you know in in, in English uh, does not let's say have the same uh, acclaim, the same reputation, the same uh, power that uh, let's say writing an, a novel in English has. So, it's it's a question of form is also very important that you write in English, you write in a novel in English, and it's published in English. And that seems to have a far greater prestige than, than, let's say, writing a play in English or writing a play in Canada and getting it, getting it translated into English. So it's also a question of form. So uh, Manjula Nayak, uh, you know, in some sense, dramatizes the debates that, uh, that, uh, that uh, occur around uh, the question of language, of what language to write in, what language to publish in, and questions of form, of what, what does it mean to actually write uh, a novel in English. Uh, when you have hitherto been uh, a writer in uh, of Canada, so the uh, the initial uh, uh, phase, the initial part of the uh, monologue, 
broken images is uh, precisely about this. And uh, later on, of course, there's a twist in the play when we realize that the English novel that uh, Manjula has, has published in her name has actually been authored by her sister, uh, Malini Nayak, who is now uh, dead. Right? So, uh, so she has plagiarized her uh, sister's uh, novel and, uh, and uh, claimed it as her own. And uh, it's only her husband, Pramod, who uh, discovers this, uh, that uh, much later after it's been published, that she had stolen the typescript from uh, Malini's uh, shelf uh, after she died. And um, uh, there are lots of suggestions that, uh, from that uh, Manjula, you know, it's quite explicit that Manjula was very insecure of her sister. Uh, despite the fact that the sister was immobile, you know, well, but, but you know, she had, I think Manjula admired and envied her sister for her, uh, her flair for English, her ability to, uh, to write in English, for the English-speaking English friends she had, and also for her beauty, the fact that she was a very beautiful woman even though she was uh, physically challenged, and that she um, also suspects that perhaps her sister had a very intimate uh, relationship with her husband Pramod, although uh, it's not uh, clear or it's not certain that it was a romantic uh, relationship. So a lot of the, uh, there are different instances in the, in the play that, su that suggest that the, that the uh, identity of, of, of being an author uh, or the identity of being a woman who, uh, you know, who, is, who writes who, and who plagiarizes her sister's novel uh, is uh, you know, a very mediated relationship. So uh, an author has a very mediated relationship to language uh, and, uh, and to her reader. Right. And so it's not a direct relationship, but it's also so the entire play seems to be about about the politics of mediation, of uh, of the mediation of desire, and the and the mediated relationship that an author has to uh, the figure of the author has to his or her writing and to his or her readership. Right. So it's not a direct uh, determined uh, relationship, but it's it's something which is mediated by uh, many other uh, cultural, economic, and political factors. Uh, so we need to actually explore this point of mediation in greater detail in uh, the in the monologue. Right? So in the broken images, if you just pay attention to the opening stage directions of the play, it says uh, the interior of a television studio. A big plasma screen hangs on one side, big enough for a close-up on it to be seen clearly by the audience. On the other side of the stage, a chair and a typically telly table, strong, wide semicircular. At the back of the stage are several television sets with screens of varying sizes. A small red bulb glows above the table, high enough not to appear on the television screen. Manjula Nayak walks in. She's in her mid-thirties or forties and has a confidence stride. She is wearing a label mic. It is immediately evident that she's at home in broadcasting studios. She looks around. Right? So the uh, set the setting is of a television studio with a big plasma screen uh, on one side. And on the other side, there's a stage of the stage, there's a chair and a telly table uh, on which there are, uh, she sits. And behind the, te the telly table, you have uh, several television sets uh, with screens of varying sizes. And you have a small red bulb above the table, which is high enough to not appear on the television screen. And Manjula Nayak appears as someone who is, you know, mid-30s, middle-aged, uh, rather confident and seems to be completely at home uh, in the broadcasting studio. And uh, you see how her relationship to uh, the, uh, the audience and the readership, I mean, I'm talking about the, the audience that's watching the play as well as the, the readership who is the potential readership of her novel. So uh, it's an interesting irony or contrast uh, between two media. So on one hand, you have uh, Manjula Nayak playing uh, uh, an actor in a play who is present before her audience, who's watching her perform. And you also have uh, Manjula Nayak performing uh, before a camera, right? So the camera, so you see that the difference between uh, a play and, uh, and a film or a, re or a, or a camera recording of uh, a talk where, uh, you know, in, in theater, you have uh, a rather unmediated relationship with the actor. Uh, you, uh, the emphasis lies on language and on the actor's body. 
that is supposed to emote and express and um, conjure up uh, space, physical space through language. And on the other hand, you have the camera which determines what the uh, audience uh, will see or should see, what it should focus on. And the emphasis of film may not uh, be entirely on space, on space and the actor's body, but may also be able to capture other time-space continuums, other, other uh, layers of uh, temporality, or other, other experiences of time and space. So uh, these, two, uh, these two media, uh, theatre and uh, film, cinema and camera, are uh, contrasted. Uh, on stage. There's an announcer who introduces uh, the audience to uh, Manjula Naik and, um, and so you also have the uh, imagination of Manjula Naik appearing on a TV show in front of a live audience. So the live audience could be the audience watching the play but there could also be another audience which cannot be seen which is uh, watching her through the camera. So you have two layers. You have uh, the layer of the physical space of the of the of the playhouse, uh, and and you also have on the stage, and you also have the invisible audience. So the audience is at once invoked as an absence as well as a presence in the play. Uh, so the announcer introduces her as uh, someone who has who is a renowned Kannada short story writer, and. Uh, who was also a lecturer in English, again, you know, is reflective of the bilingual uh, status of many regional writers, right, writers who write in regional languages, who have to probably uh, teach English uh, because that's the only job they can get, uh, which, is, which is even fairly decently paid uh, job. But she's been writing in Canada. And uh, there's also a very self-reflexive uh, you know, reference to the larger literary establishment uh, of Canada, but also which is true of many other Indian languages. So there are other Canada uh, writers who were lecturers in English, B.M. Shri Gokak Adiga. Right? So that's what the announcer says. You also have modern ones, he goes on to say, uh, Lankesh, Shantinath, Anantamurti. And then there's A.K. Ramanujan. And uh, so the novel that Manjula Nayak has published in English is called The River Has No Memories. And uh, she also, the announcer also mentions that she has made a lot of money through royalties from uh, her British publishers who have published the novel to great acclaim. And uh, the novel has become a bestseller all across the world. And so there is this uh, initial uh, uh, reference to the fact that writing in English uh, involves uh, fame and, and a lot of money. And uh, there's also the suggestion that, you know, there is that this whole idea of writing in English also implies selling oneself, you know, uh, almost prostituting oneself to a larger global uh, audience and readership where uh, you know you you sell yourself in order to actually acquire potentially acquire it's not guaranteed of course but potentially acquire greater recognition as opposed to writing in a regional language and she mentions uh, the uh, two questions that many writers are normally asked writers who have switched languages from let's say regional a regional language to english the first question that she says uh, she's been asked by her readers is that uh, after having written in Canada all your life, why did you choose to write in English all of a sudden? Do you see yourself as a Canada writer or as an English writer? What audience do you write for? And variations on that theme. And then she says, uh, she replies saying that she had, she, she had foreseen how many people she would upset by writing in English. Uh, many of the intellectuals, her peers, her writers, have accused her of betraying uh, Canada by writing in, in English. And uh, she then responds saying, to these charges, she responds saying that, uh, that uh, writing in a particular language, uh, you know, does not necessarily mean that one is actually expressing one's uh, true self, one's authentic self. There is no correspondence between language and uh, the authentic uh, and an authentic sense of uh, selfhood. So she says that it came to her spontaneously. She claims that she wrote in English because all her ideas, her thoughts, her feelings spontaneously burst out in English, she, she says. And then she also defends herself by saying that she's not abashed. 
she's not ashamed for writing in English uh, because even though she, even despite the fact that she knows that uh, writing writing in English may guarantee her a uh, greater fame and money so she's not uh, she doesn't seem ashamed of that even though people have accused her of uh, of being uh, you know of um, not of not being true to the cause of Kanda that of being corrupt and greedy but then she feels that she is uh, she is um, she's honest about it she's honest about the fact that she has she wrote it also for the money right not just for creativity but also for money so she she also says later on um, about she talks about the institutionalization of uh, indian literature uh, institutions like the sahitya academy and what they have to say about the politics of language uh, and and form so while her british publishers appreciate her novel because they think it is so indian it captures uh, the Indian self really well. There are other uh, Indian writers who who feel that English is a medium of dishonesty. Right? That's that's how that's what Manjana quotes, saying that for many Indian writers, English is a medium of dishonesty. Of course, one could also ask how many Kannada writers are honest in what they write in Kannada. But if you did that, you'd be immediately condemned as a traitor. You can't win. So writing in Kannada doesn't necessarily mean that you're being authentic and sincere. Just like how writing in English does not necessarily mean that you're being inauthentic and lacking in sincerity. Recently, the president of the Central Sahitya Academy, the National Academy of the Letters, who shall remain nameless, declared that Indians who write in English do so in order to make money. That by writing in English, they confess their complicity in the global consumer market economy. He, of course, spoke in English. Speaking in English, as you know, gives you the authority to make oracular pronouncements on Indian literatures and languages. But my response to the charge that I write in English for money would be, why not? Isn't that a good enough reason? Would you like to see what royalties I earned when I wrote in Canada? Yet the accusation hides, or perhaps reveals, a grim anxiety. As is clear from the dictum of the president of the academy, what is at issue is not creativity but money. What hits everyone in the eye is the money a writer in English can earn. The advance I receive from my novel the advance only, mind you, help me resign my job and concentrate on writing. Of course, it is a cause for jealousy. Having struggled in Canada, I can understand that. A Canada proverb says, a response is good, but a meaningful response is better. Meaningful, artha purna. The Canada word for meaning is artha, which also means money. And of course, fame, publicity, glamour, power. Right? So she is not abashed, she's not ashamed, and she does not defend herself at this charge of uh, intellectual prostitution. She says that I'm perfectly fine writing uh, for the money and the money the royalties have received as opposed to the, the petty royalties I received for writing in Canada have enabled me to resign my job and concentrate, be a full-time writer. Right. The second question that she's asked about is the book itself. And the second question is more about the question of uh, representation because she represents, she claims to have represented the life of her sister, uh, Malini, uh, uh, who is disabled, right? And so her, reader, her readers are often ask her, how, how is it possible that she's able to represent the life of a disabled woman with such uh, fidelity, with such accuracy, right? I mean, they're quite uh, amazed by uh, the intimacy, uh, the familiarity with which she's able to recount the life of her sister as if she were herself uh, disabled, right? So the whole question of experience in fiction that is, does fi is fiction a direct, unmediated re uh, representation of social reality, or is it a mediated relationship? Right. So uh, the the, no the novel, I mean, the play itself is really about the status of fiction and the kind of the kinds of truth claims that fiction makes. Uh, what is the status of fiction? Is fiction true, or is fiction false, or is fiction ni uh, neither? Right. And uh, what's the register uh, of of fiction? Then she also talks about, she describes her sister's life and she says she was physically challenged, uh, suffered from what is technically called meningomyelocele. The upper part of her body was perfectly normal. Below the waist, the nervous system was damaged, completely dysfunctional. And there were a series of operations that Malini had to undergo, which uh, reduced her existence to uh, being an invalid, spending her entire life confined to a wheelchair. Six years ago, Manjula says, my parents died. She came to stay with us in our house in Jainagar, and I nursed her. During the last few months, it was quite clear she didn't have much time left. 
I am childless and she became my child. Truly, the book is about her. I have dedicated it to her memory. She died last year, just a few months before the book came out. I have tried to relive what I learned about her emotional life as I nursed her, tended to her, watched helplessly as she floated into death. I miss her. I miss my beautiful, gentle sister. So she portrays herself as a caregiver who has witnessed her sister dying. And she says that she's the only character. Her sister is the only character in the novel drawn from life, right? while the other characters are entirely fictional. So she, she makes a claim that her representation of, of uh, Malini is the only uh, true representation in the novel, while everything else has been uh, invented. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the monologue talks about uh, th this whole idea of fiction and fictional representation of reality, which will always be an oblique representation, right? So even if, if we were to know from the very beginning that the novel was written by Malini, right? Uh, and Malini was the real author of the novel, would we then be able to say that this is a true and authentic representation of the reality of what it means to be disabled? Right? So these are questions that are open, open questions, that what counts as an authentic uh, and real representation of life and what isn't or what doesn't? Or does the very veracity, the very truth value of fiction, does that matter in the first place? I mean, this is not to condone works of fiction that are blatantly, uh, blatantly distort uh, history uh, and uh, distort the experiences of people. But to then say that, his, that fiction is a true and accurate representation of reality uh, would also not then be uh, accurate because fiction has certain liberties, can take certain liberties, can take certain flights of imagination, which may not necessarily be a, a direct, or probably never is, a direct representation of reality. And in fact, it's precisely the unmediated metaphorical relationship that fiction has to reality, which makes reality perhaps seem a lot more real than it is in, in, in reality, right? And of course, that's this is just a, a theoretical category, but then we also then consider the fact that reality is always already mediated by language and by our perceptions of it. And then the image comes on the plasma screen and the screen and the camera never seems to go off, right? So the camera, the whole idea of exposing oneself to the camera becomes a self-conscious uh, exercise in self-dramatization because Manjula is now exposing herself, right? She's exposing what she has done and she's exposing her vulnerabilities, her insecurities before the camera. And uh, there's no escape for her. That everything she says, everything, every expression of hers is, is recorded uh, and uh, telecast to uh, you know, um, a, a wider audience whom she cannot see. So it's the gaze of the camera that's fixed on her and she is the object of the gaze. And she finds it very hard to shrug off the power of the gaze. <coughs> and the image also comes across as probably, and the image is very ironic and self-conscious because the image describes itself as perhaps the subconscious, the unconscious, uh, the repressed uh, in, in Manjula's own psyche. Right? So, and uh, the image says that I'm, I'm after all just, I'm after all only you, right? I am you. And so it becomes this interesting uh, self-dramatization of the character of Manjula Nayak through her conversations that she has with herself, uh, with the plasma, with the virtual image on the screen. They're about to show a, a, a Kannada telefilm about uh, Manjula Nayak in the novel, but that's not shown. And instead, it's Manjula's own image that appears on screen. And um, there is the image constantly interrogates, uh, dissects and interrogates Manjula, Manjula's life right? and her relationship with her sister and her husband. And again, this whole interrogation is again questioning, probing the, the uh, truth value, the veracity of the novel. And uh, the image seems to be ridiculing her at some level. She says, the image says, if one had to comment, in the extreme case that one had to, that bit about your sister Malini, the tears, that could have been played down. Right? So they're, they're wondering, the image is wondering if, if Manjula exaggerated her exhibition of sorrow at the loss of her sister. Right? So it's, it's, so you know, what is being recorded on camera, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be authentic. There can also be a lot of uh, pretense, a lot of hypocrisy right, that is recorded on camera. And, but then 
we, the audience, attaches a certain sense of veracity to the camera. Just as one attaches a certain veracity to the photograph, one attaches a certain veracity to the camera and what one sees through the camera. Right? So uh, that she cried before the camera seems to capture her genuine sorrow at the loss of her sister. So Manjula is obviously playing with the gaze of the camera that now uh, the camera captures me uh, as someone who is uh, genuinely bereaved at the loss of her sister. Manjula says the novel doesn't really do her justice. She was attractive, more attractive than me, intelligent, more intelligent than me, and vivacious, which I never was. I accepted that. She radiated life from the wheelchair to which she was confined. I have always been reconciled to being the second best. Right. So the status of the camera, of what the camera records, and the status of fiction are similar because they're both simulating a particular reality. Right. And one can never say whether that simulation is real or not, whether it's true or not. And Manjula here slowly reveals her insecurity, uh, her uh, sense of jealousy uh, towards her sister. The image, her illness was unfortunate, but because of it, she got the best of everything. Manjula, who's now defensive, says, she never asked for anything. Soon after her birth, the moment the gravity of her situation was realized, my parents moved to Bangalore, took a house in the Korumangla extension. She became the, the apple of their eye. When she was old enough to go to school, a teacher came home to teach her English and mathematics. Everything else, she read up for herself. History, philosophy, anatomy. She was hungry, hungry for life, and gobbled it all up. Right? So uh, when her parents discovered that Malini has a disability, uh, a debilitating one, they divert all the attention to her, which makes Manjula feels, feel neglected and left out. And then she wonders whether uh, she would have been as bright if uh, she'd received all that love and attention. Right? So she feels uh, jealous and insecure. Manjula says, they left me with my grandparents in Dharwad, an affectionate couple. They fussed over me, but no substitute for parents. When vacations approached, I could barely wait to get to Bangalore. And once I finished college, I found a job in Bangalore and came and lived with them. Those were the happiest days of my life, halcyon. But then I met Pramod. We got married and settled down in Jayanagar. Father helped with the house, but he left most of his money in her name for her care. She was always the focus, naturally. And they moved to a, a locality in Bangalore, which is largely non kannadiga So Kormangla and Bangalore being rather cosmopolitan city, uh, she uh, finds herself feeling rather uh, estranged in uh, an, a locality which is largely non kannadiga And uh, she then here uh, expresses a certain side to herself, which is provincial, which is proud of being Kannadiga, which wants to breathe the language, she says. Right? And she wants to live in the heart of Kannada culture. So this is one aspect, one side to the writer who revels in the presence of uh, the language and in the presence of Kannada speakers uh, and literature. But then uh, she seems to also uh, give that up for the larger glamour uh, and prestige that is attached to uh, writing in English. She says that, let me say I could have written about my sister in Kannada. She breathed, laughed, dreamt in English. Her friends spoke only English. Having her in my house for six years helped improve my English. So she also reveals the fact that her sister had a greater access to English and to English speaking friends unlike her. And uh, through the interrogation, the conversation that she has with the image, she uh, slowly uh, reveals, un unravels uh, those aspects of herself uh, which, which are insecure, which uh, feel that she's competing with her sister for her intellect and for her English language and writing skills. You know, she also depicts, uh, of course the novel is not hers, but then the novel itself being written by Malini suggests is a reflection of Manjula, right? So Manjula appears in the novel as a negative character, as the first cousin of the writer and not her own sister, right? So uh, it's a fairly negative uh, character. Pramod himself comes across as someone who, Pramod is uh, Manjula's husband, who has an intimate relationship with Malini, uh, as someone who is not very good looking and striking, um, but an intelligent, warm and lovable person, right? Fun loving, fond of practical jokes, jokes, noble and simple, almost simple minded. And then Manjula describes uh, her uh, early years, the early years uh, of her relationship with Pramod when Pramod uh, quoted her and played a prank on her by writing a letter 
you know, uh, about her close friend Lucy. Uh, so he addressed a letter to Manjula uh, and wrote about her, uh, his feelings for her close friend Lucy. And he wrote a similar letter addressed to Lucy, uh, confessing his uh, love for Manjula. And so they both receive uh, letters about uh, Pramod's uh, love for the other woman. And uh, that again is an instance of, of how her initial uh, relationship with Pramod is mediated through her close friend Lucy. Right? So uh, that, that in some sense uh, evokes perhaps her desire and longing for the man. That uh, love and romance, even if it is just a prank, even if it's a joke, is developed, is triggered, is developed and intensifies when it is mediated through a third person. And then, of course, the ruse worked, she says, the maid says, the ruse worked, the prank worked, and they ended up getting married. And she, of course, loses her friendship with Lucy, who stops talking to her. And uh, then, uh, of course, Pramod continues his friendship with Lucy. But then uh, the image wonders whether, of course, if you think of the image as an extension of Manjula herself, whether Manjula probably wonders whether, aside, aside to her, aside of her, um, I mean, uh, wonders if they had an affair. Right? Uh, but there's another side to her which believes that, uh, that uh, Pramod is a sincere husband and uh, is, is too much in love with her to, be, uh, to have an affair with another woman. There's also an insinuation of, uh, to the, fa the possibility that Pramod had a very close relationship with Malini because um, Pramod spent most of his time at home with Malini, uh, who could not move out of the house. So the image asks uh, Manjula whether she did not mind that uh, her husband was spending a lot of time with her sister. And she says, mind, thank God for it. You see, he's in software development, works from home. So he has a work from home job. She was confined in her chair. Can you imagine what would have happened if they hadn't got on? He's basically a two-woman man. I used to call him Tirupati Timmapa. Right? So she almost seems to desire her husband because uh, there are other women who desire him. Right? So even her, uh, her love and her desire for her husband are mediated by other women in his life. And then suddenly Manjula is very upset that the image is constantly interrogating her relationship and her marriage and uh, her private life. And then she is on the verge of trying to switch off the image uh, by pulling off the wire and the plug. But then uh, she's unable to do it. And then they continue the conversation. And the image says that it is trapped. It is trapped in an existential angst, in an existential situation in the camera. It's almost like as the Manjula is unable to escape from her own gaze, her own self gaze. She's trapped uh, in her own conscience, in her own uh, psyche. Right? Because her psyche is torn apart by these contradictions, you know, of on the one hand wanting to be an autonomous, independent, well-known, famous, uh, acclaimed writer in English, and on the other hand uh, being attached, having her loyalties towards Canada, Canada culture, Canada literature, and uh, the, the whole image of the double of, 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 of a sister who seems to have greater access to English, has grown up with English-speaking friends, and is the actual uh, author of the English novel that she has plagiarized. And the insecurity of being married to a man who is attractive and who has drawn the attention of many other women, right? So nothing that belongs to her, uh, she can actually call her own, right? So Manjula is constantly trying to, constantly feels estranged and alienated from her life, right? From everything that she thinks belongs to her, right? Uh, so she's always estranged from her writing, uh, partly because by virtue of being an author, she is concealed by language. Uh, she is displaced by the very novel that she writes. And, uh, you know, the reader's relationship is with the novel and not necessarily with the author. So the author may not necessarily write for a specific uh, readership or an audience uh, when she is writing the novel, right? Uh, so uh, there's that. So there's this, so everything out here is the the relationship of the author to her own name, to her to literature, to her own writing, to the readers she writes for, right? To her husband in this case, or to her sister. Everything is mediated by language, by language and by representation. Right? 
and this is when the image parodies uh, itself, uh, anticipates the interpretations that one may have, uh, psychoanalysts may have of the image. There was a time when critics would have said, I was your conscience, like in the good old Hindi films. The hero re reaches out for the money and suddenly his shadow starts speaking. <clears throat> Don't. That money is meant for your father's medicines. Do you want to break your mother's heart? Or it, would be, it could be his image in the mirror. But those simple days are gone. Today I would have to be a Freudian unconscious. Everything, everything you censored, repressed material, forbidden impulses, taboo rec recollections, a dream, bad dream. Actually, I could be an interpretation of a bad dream. The image giggles. Sorry about that. Look, you ask me who I am. Does one ever know who one is? It's the ultimate question, isn't it? Where did I come from? Where am I going? You are the English lit person. Hamlet started it all. You should know. No use asking me. We could go back to Narcissus, of course. He loved his image, which is more than can be said about you. What about the romantic period? The doppelganger, Dr. Jek Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the picture of Dorian Gray. And if you're willing to go beyond English and consider Russian literature, the Dostoevsky is the double. Jacques Lacan would have embraced me if he were here. I'd be quite happy to be a central, transcendental signified. You could deconstruct me out of existence. So this is, of course, uh, e echoing the, uh, the potential psychoanalytic interpretations of what it means to have an image as an extension of oneself, as a, as a double, as a doppelganger. Then there's the instance of Sita, which the image gives. Sita, yes, take Sita. As her other, there was a Maya Sita, the illusory Sita. According to some versions of the Ramayana, it was actually the illusory Sita that Ravana carried off. And then in the later sections of the epic, Rama replaces the absent Sita with a golden image. It seems as the men in the Ramayana never got to the real Sita. So the whole question really is about, about the ontology. What is the ontology and what is the epistemology of the self? Right? So who, who is the real self? Right? How does one arrive at the real authentic self? Through language, through representation, through relationships, right? So who, who is, through perception, who, who is the real self? How does one, de one determine uh, the, rea the reality of the self? Uh, is it possible to capture a real self that is not always already mediated by language and structure? And the image somehow tries to convince Manjula to actually uh, confess that she has plagiarized the novel. And then uh, Manjula confesses that Pramod uh, wanted to move the, the, the United States because he gets a job in Los Angeles uh, for being a software wizard, right? so he decides to move. She claims that she was invited to, to New York after the novel was released and there's much fanfare in the opening inauguration of the, the release of the, of the novel and uh, she gets uh, an email fra from her husband from, the, from Los Angeles congratulating her on the, on the novel. And this ha all this happens soon after Malini dies. Uh, Pramod moves to uh, Los Angeles and uh, Malini is awarded for the release of the novel. And um, she also recounts how Malini was very upset when Pramod got an offer from the US. And then she died and then she claims to have sent the typescript to the literary agent in Britain. And within a couple of weeks, received an email from the agent accepting the novel for publication. And suddenly she feels extremely insecure because she had emotionally and financially depended on her husband. And now that he is away, she feels lost and abandoned. And then she realizes that her husband knows that she is responsible for having plagiarized the novel and that she has plagiarized her sister's novel by stealing the typescript soon after she died and submitting it to a British uh, literary agent. She finally confesses that her marriage broke down because of uh, the fact that she plagiarized her novel from, uh, from Malini and that she allowed, uh, she allowed herself to get insecure, uh, to compete with Malini. And uh, she's constantly trying to convince herself uh, that her husband didn't have an affair with her sister. But then it remains ambiguous. Perhaps they did have an intimate relationship, uh, although the nature of the relationship remains uncertain. But then she, that becomes a, becomes a cause for great insecurity and jealousy in uh, Manjula. Manjula confesses towards the end, uh, I did not steal it, she tells the image. Malmi liked to sign herself M. Nayak, 
My letter accompanying the manuscript was signed Manjula Nayak. The agent obviously thought we were the same person. Her, his reply arrived at Pramod's email address. We shared a computer, you see. Why does a Kannada write, writer need a computer anyway? He printed off a copy of the reply and left it for me on the kitchen table. As I read the email, I could sense him watching me. From his corner, I decided to face him. How can you accuse me of plagiarism? I wanted to demand. Are you implying I knowingly stole my sister's novel? I knew he would deny any such insinuation. I was raring to pitch into him, wring the truth out of him. Why don't you say what is in your mind? I wanted to go on. You know it was a genuine mistake. The agent is an Englishman, unfamiliar with Indian names. She, she, she tries to pass off the novel. She, she very well knows that she is plagiarizing the novel, but she tries to pass it off as a mere accident. Instead, I heard myself asking, why did you leave the email message on the kitchen table? He looked nonplussed, and it wasn't what I had meant to ask. But I had to plunge on. You know, I have a study of my own, a desk at which I work. Oh, I'm sorry, he said. Picked up the message from the kitchen table, took it into my study and plonked it down on my writing desk. Here, the message. That was it. He pretended he didn't know what I was getting at, but he did know. You could see it in his anger. He had never been so angry before. Not with me. The subject was never mentioned again. Right? So the, the husband, of course, realizes much later, after the novel has been published, that Manjula is responsible for, for plagiarizing the novel. And so he is furious with her. So, um, you know, it's interesting that um, Manjula realizes that the very novel that she's plagiarized from Malini portrays her, Manjula, as a very shallow woman, as a shallow, jealous, insecure woman. And that she should publish it as it is, in some sense, works against her. Right. So it becomes, uh, uh, you know, another instance where she begins to subvert herself. Right. She, she, uh, she ends up uh, uh, fighting with herself, uh, with her own, uh, by being entrapped in her own uh, sense of uh, self. And as she's trying to destroy the image, the screen, towards the end, the screen uh, emerges as a resurrection of Malini Nayak herself. And the image says, I'm Malini Nayak, the English novelist. Manjula Nayak, the Kannada short story writer, was decimated the moment she read my novel. She thus obliter obliterated all differences of ink and blood and language between us and at one full stroke morphed into me. Of course, I shall continue with the name of Manjula Nayak. As Manjula Nayak, I have been invited as visiting professor to seven prestigious American universities. I use that nomenclature for my passport, my bank accounts, property and financial investments. However, I am in truth Malni, my genius of a sister who loved my husband and knew Canada and wrote in English. Right? So you see how uh, this uh, authorship becomes here, of course, literally speaking, uh, a question of identity theft. But it's also the fact, if you looked at, it, looked at the play in a more post-structuralist fashion, you would get a sense that uh, you're talking about how the author, the figure of the author itself is uh, a, pseudo, a pseudonym, right? a false name, uh, a, a signifier, an empty signifier, under which one writes, one produces. And the way in which the author dies and is replaced by the text, by the novel itself, which reaches out to people, uh, to un very often very unintended uh, audiences. So that, in some sense, uh, presents the two layers of the play, right? of how the play becomes a literal metaphor for uh, plagiarism, but for, for, uh, for the way language takes the place of the author. And the author becomes a mere anti-signifier. Right? That doesn't signify anything as such. Right? There's no essential self to be revealed behind the persona of the author. And that me meaning, in some sense, is also being deferred. Right. So you don't really get a sense of who the real Manjula is until towards the end when she mo she's morphed into one. The, both the sisters become one, but then to say, the, the, but then there is no essential ident identity to Malini Nayak either. Right. So it's uh, it's just uh, a claim that one makes towards one's own sense of identity, which remains illusory. Right. There's there's a, it, it, the sense of self, uh, the, the act of identifying oneself as oneself remains uh, fragile and, um, and and illusory towards the very end. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.